Welcome everybody. Today we have a big challenge in front of us. Uh, I decided to uh, open a next can of worms and to say some statements to the area of UV, of the ultraviolet light, which seems to be a very important topic in chemical culture. And I dressed myself properly I speak for me and for my label and for the Life with Chameleons group and we will talk about sun and its effects on the, our chameleons. Um, because this topic is really quite complex and uh, we cannot uh, really um, handle it very quickly. If we are quick, we will be dirty and I prefer to watch uh, at things from a complex uh, perspective. It means we will look at it from the uh, perspective of definitions, we will look at it from the perspective of science, we will look at it from the perspective of valid experience, and uh, we will uh, look at it from the perspective of logic. Um, you know, people often discuss things like that in uh, really arguing which method is proper, which is not proper, and they cannot come to a conclusion. Why? Because it's not about methods. It is first about the meaning. It is about uh, how we understand the problem, how we uh, understand the context in which we move, and how we actually understand how all the particles of the ecological uh, factors and animals and us and technique and uh, logistics and science and so on how all these particles come together in the middle to reveal a piece of truth that we can then take and uh, do something with it and this is what i would like to do with you and this will not be an easy journey so please hold your heads we start and the journey will be quite long but at the end I promise you, you will understand much more about chameleons and their behavior in the wild. You will understand much more about uh, UV light as such and its interaction with biological substance, specifically with vertebrates and specifically with chameleons. And we will do some implications that might be a little bit revolutionary, uh, but will be very logical and very simple to apply for your day-to-day -day practice in practicing the uh, good practice of the naturalistic chemical culture. So let's hit the road. Now, let us take a little, just a little excursion to the not so far past. It will be 20, 30, 40 years ago that we start. At this time, uh, the herpetoculture already existed. <clears throat> the main postulates were uh, put together by fantastic people like Philippe de Vos, Jolie and others. Uh, the, ultra, uh, the UV light uh, has been studied by scientists from the uh, physical uh, point of view, uh, from the point of physics, and of course uh, with uh, Gary Ferguson and his investigations, he made a huge step forward in, in understanding how uh, UV light uh, interferes with uh, the reptiles and made very practical and, and very nice uh, implications uh, in the science and in the day-to-day -day practice of the herpetoculturists. Now, if you really go back to my youth, which was like the 80s, and I started to be the herpetoculturist and uh, uh, studied the, started to study the uh, reptiles in the wild and in captivity and started really to uh, discover the beauty and, and uniqueness of chameleons. I have to tell you that we had nothing in our hands. Uh, we did not have any UV lamps, okay? They were not existent. So uh, we knew about UV light and its importance, but we did not have anything in hand. And I can tell you that uh, I made it not to have any struggling animal with MBD, even in the 90s, okay? 
so we found out the path through the dark woods of uh, herpetoculture, technology and so on, in order to give the animals what they desperately needed uh, without letting them starve and without letting them uh, struggle and suffer. And uh, uh, now uh, in the last, uh, let's say, two decades, we uh, watch an explosive uh, uh, and, and fantastic tendency that what we had to really do, do it yourself way with, with these hands and, and the lots of tools and the lots of creativity in the past, you can go and buy like that. Uh, nowadays, uh, the um, fabric, fabricants and, and the producers of, of uh, terrarium equipment, including lamps, are just uh, uh, like uh, running a race who will be the first to, to propose a great uh, um, uh, UV light, who, is, who will be the first to propose the, the greatest um, LED lights and so on. This is a period which I'm very happy about that it came because it makes lots of our decisions very, very easy and lots of our solutions really straight to the point. But uh, there were times where we had nothing and they helped us to really investigate in depth what happens and how actually the biology of uh, chameleons and reptiles is shaped uh, in the, the way that, that we can use uh, it and we can understand it and all this we can then actually uh, turn into a good and successful and ethically correct uh, breeding programs uh, whose results we can see on the market until, until today. So nowadays there are some big names in, in our fields that uh, have also their opinions on, on UV and uh, uh, we can, we can uh, hear for instance uh, a friend of mine and, and a, a fantastic guy that dedicates his life and, and really um, digs as deep as he can in the field of uh, uh, naturalistic uh, chameleon uh, culture and husbandry of chameleons, which is Bill Strand, I will sit him in a in a very condensed way. When when he talks about UV light, he always says it's it's very complex, and and uh, um, uh, he really tries to to uh, find out what are the main triggers. And he did a perfect uh, way, and he I, I like his approach. What is actually the, the uh, result of, of, his, uh, of his investigation. And it is, he says, basically, guys, look, I have, Bill says, I have done so many experiments with so many uh, sources of UV that I know that if you do it like what I do, you are safe, so you can repeat it and your chameleon will be fine. I like that approach. I like the approach because it's very practical and it is based on evidence and it is based on real experience, on real experiments, on real data, on, on, on real animals in real cages and so on. And this is one of the vivid approaches how we can, how we can approach it, that we can listen to the masters, listen to the nestors of, of herpetoculture and trust their uh, uh, investigations and experiments and, 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 and experience, and then do what they advise us. I fully, fully agree that that's one of the, one of the um, uh, uh, possible ways. But then, you know, there are other guys, uh, I will not name them now, um, that uh, might not be as, uh, you know, concise and precise and uh, scientifically correct, like Bill is always, and they simply experiment. Uh, you know, uh, to experiment with uh, living creatures is of course possible. Uh, and it's uh, on the margin, the edge of the ethics, what is an ethical and what is an, an unethical experiment. But uh, then you can really uh, the, like do experiments which show something, but if you do not control the environment properly, you come up with a completely wrong but very clear uh, conclusions, yeah? And this has happened, this has happened. Some of you will uh, understand what I talk about if I speak about one guy that exposed uh, the uh, Yemen chameleons 
to uh, UV uh, exposures with bulbs uh, having 14 to 16 percent of uh, of uh, UVB in in their spectrum, and he sw has sworn that they they do well and everything is proper, and he swore that it's actually absolutely perfect specifically for the translucents yeah that they do well they cannot do well come on because they lack melanin in their in their skin and then the uh, uh like uh, uv uh exposure to their organism inevitably of course causes cancer and damage of internal organs of cells of stem cells and and so on and so on so uh, be very careful to whom you listen to, because some of the people present uh, their experiences like a truth, but they have no validity. And, and what they say is actually um, close to something that uh, I cannot say now what, what is it, but it's a, a piece of uh, a brown substance uh, being uh, uh, end result of the metabolism of uh, the male cow. OK, so. Uh, there are lots of people that uh, try to be very careful in what they are doing. There are lots of people that try to uh, go the way of the naturalistic uh, 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 husbandry and try to uh, listen to us people that are quite often in the field and uh, bring good tidings from the wild. Uh, uh, knowing what the chameleons and when and how they are doing and so on and we bring the observations back to uh, to science and then to the white public uh, to explain what is the reality out there what is the reality out there where the chameleons live the natural uh, ways of life where they uh, co-evolved with the environment for maybe uh, hundreds thousands and millions of years uh, how they cope with the changes that uh, are brought now by humans to their environment and so on. And then these people try to uh, take our knowledge and uh, redo something in the, in the captivity. And there are other tendencies like what we see in uh, the poor uh, industry with uh, the ball pythons, with the um, beaded dragons, with the uh, uh, leopard geckos that uh, some people believe that the best thing what you can do for a reptile is to put it in a small uh, uh, box uh, full of uh, uh, paper and, and uh, plastic stuff and, and uh, keep it uh, uh, like in a, in, a, in a cave and uh, like in a, in a jail and this is the way how we can make money and so on. I, I do not, I, I'm not a representative of that. Uh, that stream and I actually uh, discourage you to think that that's, that's correct. Uh, not even for those uh, uh, that um, the species that I mentioned and in no way it can work for the chameleons. So what I want to tell you today is let us see the particles of science, of practical experience, of my observations from the wild, of the logic, of the general logic, and let us paint together the picture of the proper approach to UV lighting in captivity for the uh, naturalistic chemical culture. So, let us start with debugging and uh, unleashing some of the myths uh, tied with chameleons. In many books, including in the books of mine, but I wrote it 25, 30 years ago, uh, we believed and some people believed and labeled chameleons as uh, the so-called heliophilus uh, animals. It means animals that are attracted by sun. Yeah? Helios means sun and uh, Phylos means in, in Latin uh, the, to be attracted to, so that the chameleons are actually given as a textbook's examples of the so-called uh, heliophilus uh, uh, animals. Well, uh, it is not true. Uh, chameleons have a certain affinity to the sun and have a certain affinity to the light, of course, which is produced by sun. But in fact, if we would really want to cover the major uh, 
approach and the major uh, attitude they have towards sun is that they actually hate it and they want always to disappear from it. With little uh, small um, uh, exceptions, which are actually just uh, covering a couple of minutes or maximum tens of minutes per day, because uh, this is like a, a coin, you know, there's two sides. The one side, uh, I say, the general tendency of chameleons is to be afraid of sun and to disappear from it. But the other side of the medal is, of course, they desperately need it for their lives. So they balance somehow on, on, the, on the margin. And it is actually like with almost every substance or um, almost every factor in the life of any um, uh, living entity. Um, the first lesson you, uh, you uh, learn in toxicology, uh, which is the science about uh, poisons and toxins, is that uh, there is no toxic substance. The matter is always the doses, okay? So it's, it's like with water. Is water toxic? So you would smile and say, Peter, come on. What is not toxic? It's fine. You know, I can drink like one or two liters per day and it's fine. I say, yes, it's fine. But what about if you if you drink two gallons? What will happen? And I, I assure you, uh, uh, even even the, uh, such a substance, such a such a friendly substance like water, is actually heavily toxic if you overdose it. And uh, many of the medicaments, you know, also work with a certain doses. At certain doses, it does not work at all. At certain doses, it is a medication, and at certain doses, it is a um, a poison which which, which kills uh, and kills very quickly. By the way, we will talk today about vitamin D, and this is exactly a substance like that. If it is not enough, it is actually bad because it's uh, so uh, in parentheses toxic by its absence. You know, we need it desperately, and if it's not there, yeah. So the lack is causing big problems for our physiology, and our means our humans as well as chameleons. Uh, if uh, the vitamin D3 is available in the body of uh, uh, the vertebrate in the right doses, then it is a perfect substance which is actually enabling lots of things. I will tell you how many. And if D3 is too much, it works terribly. It is actually a very strong poison. And if you overdose it heavily, you will cause suffering and death of the animal. And this is what we need to understand. So getting back to the sun, it is not as many of us think that chameleons need sun and then they want to be on the sun all the day. It is not like that. The most of the time, the sun is something that the chameleons are extremely uh, afraid of and they tried try to hide from from sun if we speak about sun let us uh, start with some definitions yeah um, sun uh, is uh, known for everyone it is up there 150 millions of kilometers far away from us it is the center of uh, our uh, uh, solar system in which uh, our Earth is also turning around in huge circles or ellipsoids around it. And it is, of course, a star, okay? And as a star, it is uh, an object uh, of very, very high temperature and uh, uh, an object of highly concentrated energy which shines to all the uh, directions from it uh, and uh, shines with uh, specific sun rays. Sun rays are of uh, many kinds. And uh, we will not speak today about the cosmic rays and about uh, uh, X-rays and so on. We will focus on the major part of the sunlight, which is actually divided into three categories, which are for us extremely valid. The most obvious one is the white light, the so-called visible light, or we call it sometimes full spectrum light. Yes, this is the light 
which consist of wavelengths between 400 and 780 nanometers. And each of these wavelengths uh, is actually uh, attributed to a certain color from blue, light blue through green, yellow to orange and so on, uh, like the colors of the, uh, of the rainbow. <clears throat> and only if the light consists of almost equally represented all the wavelengths between 400 and 780 nanometers, we perceive the light as white, as neutral full spectrum light. If some of the lights uh, of some of the wavelengths is represented more, then we perceive the light like more bluish or like more yellowish or like more orange uh, and so on. Uh, for chameleons, this light is of course of uh, um, very high importance. Why? Because they uh, are dependent from eyes. Yeah, they uh, they uh, have all the other organs than eyes uh, underdeveloped actually, and and uh, either unfunctional or very little functional, and uh, they uh, live because they see. So this part of light. It's very important for the chameleons. I have to tell you a small mystery, and some of you know it already, that they do not only see the white light, but they can also see the infrared and the uh, ultraviolet light. Yeah? So we actually uh, cannot even imagine what chameleons see. But what we know, and we know it exactly, is that all the wavelengths, even left and right from the spectrum, of the white light are uh, of vital importance for the chameleons because they orient themselves in the environment, uh, in many areas, in their reproduction activities, in thermoregulation, in finding the uh, right reproduction uh, partner, in uh, uh, imposing to each other, in feeding and so on through the eyes. So the visible light that they can detect by their complex eyes uh, is very important. Now, uh, right from uh, this uh, this uh, spectrum of the visible light for from the human perspective, that is the so-called infrared light, which is the uh, light with wavelengths uh, more than 780 uh, nanometers. And this part of uh, the uh, spectrum uh, consists of uh, waves which are like full of energy, okay? They uh, are actually uh, uh, considered to be heat rays. So the infrared rays are equal to warmth. Through uh, all the other wavelengths, we also uh, get a certain levels of energy, but the infrared light is the heaviest in, in that respect, and, and we rely on that, and chameleons also. And left from this spectrum, we have the so-called ultraviolet spectrum, the UV, the so-called UV. The UV consists of three uh, wavelengths, uh, from, uh, consists from UVC, UVB, and UVA. And these areas are also attributed to certain wavelengths uh, from about 200 to uh, 400 uh, nanometers. And uh, they are very important for the life. The UVC, uh, the shortest uh, waves, are actually uh, uh, quite dangerous because they are actually uh, used for um, for killing germs and so on. Okay, so uh, there are the germicide, uh, germicidic uh, lamps available and so on, and they use with as exactly this part of spectrum. And then there is a tiny spectrum from 280 to 315 nanometers of wavelength, which is called UVB. Uh, we will get back to this specifically later on because it's of crucial importance for us and for the chameleons. And then between 315 and 400, there is the so-called UVA, which is also quite quite important. And altogether, all these wavelengths of these electromagnetic waves or of different kinds of light are actually uh, the decomposition of the uh, energy of the sun which is shining on us when uh, we are not in the shade. It means 
during the daytime. So the UV is of life importance for all the vertebrates in general and for chameleons in particular. Let us see its functions in a list. The notoriously known function of the UV is that it triggers the synthesis of vitamin D3, which is very important because it facilitates the metabolism of uh, calcium and phosphorus and is therefore very important for the bones and muscles and nerves function. But it has also a positive influence on skin. It prevents some skin diseases like uh, in uh, higher vertebrates the psoriasis. And UV triggers the pineal gland through the parietal eye and causes the production of triotamines that improve the mood. And it is also used for vision. Specifically, chameleons can see it. Chameleons can see the UV light and it helps them to identify the correct sexual partner, for instance, how it has been recently discovered by our German colleagues. UV light also disinfects and sterilizes using its ability to kill cells and microorganisms like viruses, fungi and bacteria. UV light causes a sunburn. It inhibits the immune system and causes its failures. It causes damage to internal organs, especially with reproducing cells like gonades or the bone marrow. UV causes some types of cancer. Uh, UV is mutagenous. It causes mutations. UV can damage eyes. It causes photokeratitis and uh, other cumulative harm effects to eyes and can cause actually blindness. Uh, thanks to UV, our skin ages. And uh, UV causes the weakening and destroying plastics and causes uh, them to lose their integrity and ex expel toxic substances, which is very important to know uh, as one of the factors why not to use plastics uh, like plastic plants and other plastics in the cage where we uh, use the UV light. UV also fades colors through its destructive impact on pigments. So, as you see, the function of the UV is by far not only uh, to trigger the vitamin D3 production, but it has uh, both positive as well as very negative and even destructive influence on living systems. Accordingly, of course, our bodies need to protect themselves against the negative and destructive uh, function of the UV light. And we do it uh, using some strategies. Uh, we do it, for instance, behaviorally. Uh, it means uh, reduced exposure to balanced meaningful levels while hiding in the shade, for instance. Uh, then we have also a physiological protection, which is mainly the production of melanin uh, in the uh, skin. And chameleons, specifically the Yemen chameleon, can actually also produce melanin in the peritoneum. It means uh, between the internal organs. And there is also an option of the dietary uh, protection against UV, which is uh, to eat antioxidants. For instance, carotenoids, vitamins C, vitamin E, and polyphenols. All this can protect us, and if I say us, it means us as vertebrates, including chameleons, against the destructive function and influence of the UV light. One more issue we need to address, which is how to measure the UV light. We have pitily only one issue and one way available, which is to use the so-called UV index, which is very unlucky because we cannot actually measure the amount of the UV, we can measure only its intensity. So it is like if you would be in a shower and you can regulate 
the intensity of the water, but you cannot measure how much water actually is pouring on you. But that's simply fact. The uh, UV light is measured uh, by the so-called UV index, which is an international standard measurement of the strength of sunburn producing ultraviolet radiation at a particular place and time. Um, the scale was developed by the Canadian scientists in uh, 1992 and then adopted and standardized uh, by the UN's World Health Organization and World Meteorological Organization two years later. Uh, it is primarily used in daily forecasts aimed at the general public and it's increasingly available as an hourly forecast as well. The UV index is designed as an open-ended linear scale directly proportional to the intensity of UV radiation that causes sunburn of human skin. Um, for example, if a light-skinned individual without sunscreen uh, begins to sunburn in 30 minutes at UV index 6, then this very individual should expect to be sunburned in about 15 minutes at UV index 12. It means twice the UV, twice as fast the sunburn happens. And this is how it works. We are capable of only measuring the intensity of the light, but not the amount of the light uh, what we would actually need. To give you an imagination of uh, how much UVI is what, uh, so imagine that, for instance, of course, at night we have UVI zero because there is no UV light detectable. Uh, the early morning sun has UVI strengths, something between one and three. Uh, in the midday, it means around noon in Northern Europe or Central Europe and Northern Americas, usually we face um, UV uh, levels around 7 to 10. Uh, at the coastal Kenya, it will be at noon around 10 or even 12. In Yemen, at uh, 2000 meters high, it will be around 14. And uh, in high mountains, like uh, uh, on Mount Kenya at the elevation of 4,300 meters, it can even exceed uh, 20. The UV light uh, is penetrating air and is actually eaten by air. It is actually uh, degraded by air. And, uh, and uh, this is what we also need to take into consideration. Uh, it is not only degraded by air, but also by other uh, substances. So that the first, the intensity of UV measured by UVI is much lower in the morning when the sun rays have to pass much longer distance to cross the atmosphere towards some certain point than if it stands just above your head at noon where the distance that it needs to cross the atmosphere is much shorter. So uh, the shorter the, the, uh, the distance, the less uh, uh, of the uh, UV will be absorbed by the air. And this is why the UVI in the uh, noontime is much higher, of course, than in the morning hours. And for our chameleons, there are two more very valid points how uh, UVI is uh, absorbed. It is, of course, absorbed also by clouds, so that uh, on a uh, clear weather, where there is no clouds and no mist and nothing, uh, you get the maximum uh, UVI. Uh, but if there are clouds, uh, the UV is sometimes uh, immeasurable. And if it rains, it is really zero. And uh, for chameleons is very valid, of course, how much of the UV is eaten and absorbed by the leaves of the trees and bushes under which they cover. And I can tell you I have made these measurements in many countries. I have made them in India, in uh, Yemen, in Oman, in Kenya, in Uganda, in Egypt, in many, many countries. 
uh, in Turkey. Uh, and uh, the result is very, very uh, like same almost always. If you uh, use a light shade, uh, for instance, a shade under a palm tree, which is actually quite penetrable through the sun rays, then the palm trees uh, provide a shade which is usually giving uh, UVI uh, levels around 2 to 4. But if you get only normal uh, deciduous tree, uh, which is normally dense like a uh, uh, normal standard tree uh, with, with leafage, then you watch uh, the UVI index close to zero. Usually it is fluctuating between zero and one, depending on whether the sun uh, shine uh, finds the path through the leafage to shine on some spot or not, but it's really reduced dramatically. So that in fact, <coughs> if the chameleon is exposed to sun, it is uh, of course exposed to the direct sun at high UVI levels, and if it is hidden in shade, it receives almost nothing or very tiny doses of uh, the UV uh, light because the UV index is very simply uh, very low. We are here exposed to sun. The sun is quite warm and shines nicely. And we make just a few steps here to the shade of this tree and you can see the light is much less the sun shines only on very few spots through the leafage and we are here actually in deep shade now look how sunny it is here outside but uh, in the bush in which the chameleons live it is quite shady it's just a few steps further look we get into the shade and this is exactly the tree where the chameleons are found. Very, very deep shade. And they hide here in the shade all the day long. Let us see a model, how a biotope of a chameleon looks in fact in the wild. We are not in a country where chameleons occur, but this is a bush where chameleons could potentially occur. And if you, if you find them, they will sit somewhere in or on this bush. They can sit either uh, on the surface of this bush, and if we speak about UV, then of course the exposure of the chameleon sitting here on the branch with no barrier between him and the sun, the exposure to the sun will be much higher and the UVI will be much higher than if we look inside of the bush where the light is much dimmer and where the intensity of the light and of the UV light will be almost unmeasurable or reaching only levels about 1.5 uh, UVI. Okay, so this is one thing that we need to take into consideration if we uh, assess the uh, biotopes of the chameleons in the wild. Now the second issue is that if you look up there in the canopies of the high trees yeah, and uh, you will measure a UV index up there high in the canopy 12 to 14 meters above our heads you will measure for instance the intensity of UVI 10 okay and if you go down back to this bush and you measure it on this branch which is samely exposed to the sun but just 15 20 meters lower you will again measure the UVI 10 why is that? The trick is that the sun is 150 millions of kilometers distant in that direction. And in physics, there is one very simple rule according to the intensity of the light. Any light, any beams diminish their intensity with the square of the distance from the source. And the source is of course very far so that uh, this 20 meters distance here does not make any change you can measure the same uv index 20 meters higher and near the uh, soil here however and this is the biggest problem in the captivity if you measure the 
UV intensity according to our sources that we have, okay? So you have the bulb here and you measure the UV index close to the bulb, just next to it. You measure the UV index 50, but if you measure it one meter below, you find out that the UV uh, levels are unmeasurable and that it, and in this distance about uh, 25 centimeters if it is six uh, percent arcadia t5ho lamp you will have the uv index around two to four uh, and, and and so on okay so this is the problem that we have and that we face in captivity and we need to find a solution for that so one of the most important principles of the naturalistic chemical culture is that we consider the cage, the terrarium, a simplified model of the biotope of the chameleons where they live actually in the wild. And this is the main principle, but in terms of UV, it brings us to a big problem. Look, if this is a model of a chameleon biotope, and we look at it as a whole, it's the big bush, okay? So we have a bush which is 10 meters uh, wide and five meters deep and seven meters high. How can we make it so small to, to squeeze it in a cage? It is not realistic. And what is also not realistic is that the sun is 150 million of kilometers high up there. So we have never the chance to have the same source high up there. And this is one of the limitations that we need simply to live with. We cannot, cannot and will never be able to really simulate this way of uh, perspective. So the perspective of, let's say, God of the bird's perspective, you know, to look at it as a biotope and uh, uh, like make the similar conditions in the cage is not realistic. We cannot do it, but there is a trick. We can look at it from a different perspective. You do not need to take this bird's perspective and look at it from the whole. We can do it different way. We can actually take the shoes of the chameleon and watch it from his perspective. We can watch the exposure to uh, the natural factors, including light, including UV beams, from the perspective of the chameleon. And let us do it because then the picture is completely different. Look, uh, let us start in the night. In the night, we will find a chameleon sitting here on the branch, okay? He will squeeze himself and shake because of the, the, the cold weather and because of the fog in which he will sit all the night, okay? He will be freezing cold, he will not move at all, he will have closed his eyes and he will not move and sit right here. Now, in the early morning, you know, the first light comes. What will the chameleon do? Uh, the weather is still very cold, so he will just open the eyes and will still almost shake from the, from the freezing uh, weather here and still sitting motionless on the branch. Now the intensity of light increases because the sun is just crawling above the horizon and now the first beams of the sunlight will touch the body of the chameleon what will the chameleon do the chameleon will release the the, the position and will try based on the signals that he receives from his photoreceptors and his thermoreceptors to utilize the ultra uh, the the infrared beams that will heat up his body because he needs now to heat up to get to the working temperature which is by the way uh, in the most of the chameleon species equal plus minus to the ambient temperature of the noon at the same time same day okay so what he will do here he will make a pancake he will put his body you know in right angle to the beams of light coming to his body and he will catch all the possible energy that he can that comes from the sun rays. This is also why the body of the chameleons is flattened from the side, not from ventral dorsal uh, perspective like in some agamas, in euromastic species and so on. Why? Because they bask and they flatten their body 
mostly in the morning and then in the evening, I will tell you later, <clears throat> because they bask in vertical position like that. Now what happens? They will stay basking and this branch for about 5, 10, maximum 15 minutes and wait until the body temperature raises to the level which is desired. Again, it is about, if we speak about chameleon uh, from the Yemen, yeah, they reach about 25 to 27 degrees Celsius. What does it mean? Uh, the thermoreceptors say it is enough. So what he will do, he will crawl into the bush down there to hide because it is enough. And as you can see, the intensity of light, because the white light beams are also shaded, yeah, is much less than in the daytime. So they spend the most hours of the day at the UV levels, completely low, not as high as exposed on the branch. It is almost unmeasurable. Maximum in such a dense bush, the levels will reach about 1.5 UVI. Okay? And now, the perspective of the chameleon that we need to take into consideration in captivity is when they bask in the early hours, the sun rises, the sun beams that reach their bodies uh, have to pass through the very long way through the atmosphere because they do not uh, go straight way, but they go in an angle. So the intensity of the, uh, of the light gets lower and they bask at levels about five to six UVI. Uh, if, if you have then chameleons from higher elevations, they can bask at, at higher elevations, of course, and, and high, high, higher uh, levels of UVI. Tell you, tell you more, okay? And then the sun comes higher, but once the, uh, the sun is high, the chameleon is not here. He is hidden all day in the bush with almost no UV, okay? So. The levels of UV when uh, the uh, when the, the, there is midnight, uh, there is a midday, uh, can reach, for instance, at the coast of Yemen uh, or coast of Kenya, which is not far from each other, around 10, 10.5, 12 UVI. If you are at the home country of the Yemen chameleon, at 2,000 meters high at Ib or Yarim in Yemen, then you measure something around 14 UVI. If you are at 2,650 meters in Kenya, like I was with my friend Gerd Fritsche, we measured uh, UVI levels at 17.4. And imagine that there is a chameleon species, uh, Trioceros shuboci, who lives at 4,500 meters high, and the levels of UVI in his home country will exceed 20 UVI. So. The trouble is not that the chameleon cannot survive in areas where the UVI, it means the intensity of the light is very high. The trouble is completely different. They do not use it because when these high levels come today, yeah, they are not exposed to the sunshine, but they are hidden in the very good and protective shade of the, of the uh, bushes. And this is why it works completely different way. At the end of the day, when the temperature starts going down and when the sun uh, starts to uh, disappear behind the horizon, some of the species can come back to the, to the basking branches, maybe on the opposite side of the, of the bush, and uh, catch some of the lights to, to survive the cold uh, winter time a little bit better and prolong the uh, period in which they have a very um, comfortable uh, body temperature. Uh, but some uh, even do not do that. So, this is the big difference, how we can watch and how we can assess the natural conditions, either from the global perspective, which we never ever are able to simulate properly in the captivity, or we can be smart and look at it from the perspective of the chameleon and simulate what is actually his exposure. It means higher exposure, in the early morning hours while they are basking, and then low exposure when they are hiding in the bushes, and then back again in the later afternoon, higher exposures uh, in, the, in the late afternoon with uh, UVI around five to six. And this is the way how we can actually 
simulate what happens to them in the wild, despite of the fact that it will not allow them to do all what they could do in the, in the wild. But if you do not allow them to do something what they anyway don't do, this is not a big harm. So we are here in central Socotra in the early morning. The sun has just came out from behind the mountain and we try to measure the UV index. As you, as you see, the UV index is around four, four and a half. And the temperature is about 91 degrees and we have about 86 percent of humidity this is if exposed to sun this is exactly the morning exposure of chameleons to sun rays so as you can see we have moved our devices to the shade and immediately the measured values drop down so the temperature is by more than five degrees lower and the humidity is only 66 percent and if we try to measure the uv exposure you will see that in a half shade it is hardly measurable it shows levels around 0.5 sometimes up to one and this is where the chameleons spend the most time of the day and as you see from the spot where we did the measurement there are two chameleons just above us a male and a female that they found last night it is a breeding season, so they keep in touch. But even in the early morning hours, they do not seem to be too much interested in basking. They stay in half shade, but they expose themselves to the sun a little bit. Let us enjoy the beautiful view of the rare Socotran chameleon, Camelo Monachus. And now let us see uh, something that can be of help for field herpetologists um, because it is not always easy to carry heavy equipment and uh, measure UVI with very expensive uh, instruments. The one I use is relatively cheap, but I calibrated it and it works fine. But we have also another option. It's a little bit funny. In a shade, these beads are colorless. If we get exposed to the little more sun, they start changing color. And when we expose them to the full sun, out of the shade, they start turning very, very dark and change the color intensively. This is a very nice help for field herpetology. You do not need to measure UVI. Just for your orientation, this is UVI of about eight to nine. And if it is colorless, UVI is up to 0 0.5, so that it does not change the color. And allow me to show you more examples of the fact that chameleons really are not found on the sun, but instead they always seek shade. So we are here at the edge of the Meru forest, close to the Meru town. And this is the home of our beloved chameleons of Cameleo or Trioceros Jacksoni. Xantolophus. This is a wonderful female that is climbing up a small tree just in the morning hours. Caribou Kenya. Now you can see how hard it is to find them in the wild. They are very nicely protected 
by the coloration. And another example on the following video uh, of the giant elephant ear chameleon from Tanzania. As you can see, he has also been found in deep shade in the high mango tree. And in the shade, also this species is found at the daytime. It is the endemics of the eastern Usambara mountain, Kinyongia Machiei. Let us now compile our knowledge that I have collected uh, during my stays in Yemen and in Oman. And let us see on the example of the Yemen chameleon, Hamelo calyptratus, and the Arabian chameleon, Hamelo arabicus, what is the typical daytime logic of their typical day in the field in the wild. On this chart, you can easily see the periods of the day from the morning till the evening. And the UVI, it means the UV index from 0 to 18, to depict the uh, way how this is distributed during the day. So obviously, the green line is the perception of the chameleon, and the orange line which is the uh, perception of uh, anyone who is actually above that and what happens if you measure it on a direct sun and not in the bush. So, uh, from uh, midnight till 6 o'clock nothing happens. Then uh, the sun is coming out and uh, slowly until about 7.30 the uh, UVI is growing uh, to the level of 6. In that moment, the chameleon actually has enough of basking and starts hiding himself in the shade. So, despite of the fact that from 7.30 till about uh, noon, the uh, UVI grows to the level of 14, the perception of the chameleon is very close to zero because he's in the deep shade. The hottest parts of the day, the chameleon stays hidden and then the UVI uh, starts to drop down until around 17 o'clock when the chameleon again starts basking and uh, being on the sun because the sun is weak already. So you can see that the uh, uh, curves show very clearly the difference between the UVI as it is measured and the UVI exposure of the chameleon. The green line is the perception of the chameleon when we uh, dress the shows of the chameleon and see it from his perspective. But the orange line is the global perspective as it is in the wild but outside of the bush. On this graphic, we see the cumulative amount of UV energy that the chameleon has actually absorbed. For that, we need to actually uh, introduce one correction, which we need because of the fact that I commented already, we do not have ability to measure the doses of the UVI. We have the ability only to measure the intensity. However, the intensity uh, multiplied by the duration is actually equal to an amount. So that I have provisionally just uh, built up a system of the UVI hours, which uh, then depict the doses of the uh, uh, irradiation by UV that the chameleon has actually absorbed during the day. So you can see that until six o'clock there is zero and then cumulatively it grows then it grows very slowly because the exposure is very little and then it again grows uh, in the late afternoon and then it stays stable because in the night there is no UVI. Uh, and uh, measurable and uh, the UV is actually not there.
what we can get this way actually is uh, an amount which we measure uh, that says to us how much of the doses of the UV the chameleon has actually absorbed. And we land it at the level of around 20 UVI hours. This is a very important factor for our uh, further investigations and logical thinking. On this graphics, we see the white light intensity perception of the chameleon. The graphics is very similar to what we saw in the case of UV, but um, we actually see that the chameleon is exposed to zero white light in the night time and from six o'clock till seven uh, in the afternoon, uh, he is exposed to light. The light intensity grows, however, because uh, the chameleon again hides in the shade, he's not perceiving the highest uh, intensity levels as uh, they are uh, present in the wild outside of the bush, but uh, the uh, light intensity of the white light uh, somehow fluctuates around the theoretical average. And in this last graphics, we see the distribution of the irradiation by the infrared light, but we do not perceive it uh, as uh, the light intensity, we just measure it in temperature, either in uh, Celsius or Fahrenheit. You can see that the uh, average the temperature is below 20 degrees, so in the uh, high and mid 60s in the night time, and then the uh, perception of the chameleon again differs from what is actually happening in the wild outside of the bush. Because during the basking time, uh, in a very short period of time, the chameleon accumulates actually so much heat in his little body that he increases the temperature to the level to which the ambient temperature, it means the temperature of the air, is growing only around noon and stays uh, at this level around noon. Once he is hiding uh, into the uh, bush, of course his temperature slightly drops down, but then he does not uh, uh, anymore uh, bask during the day, but uh, he exchanges the heat with the air which is surrounding him so that he keeps almost the same little bit uh, lower uh, or little bit higher temperature than what is the surrounding air and he against, uh, again uh, raises the temperature just thanks to the evening basking above the level to prolong a little bit the period uh, in which his temperature is higher than uh, of the air, which is then quite cold and drops very quickly uh, under the level of the uh, 70 uh, degrees Fahrenheit, 20 degrees Celsius. Based on all these graphics, we can very clearly see what are the temperatures and what are the uh, levels of irradiation by the individual uh, types of the light divided by infrared uh, visible light and the most important part for us today, which is the ultraviolet light. So let us make a summarization of what we have learned about the UV exposure of the chameleons in the wild. So the fact is chameleons are exposed to UV. It is undisputable and it's clear. They get UV exposure. The question is whether it's intentional or it is artificial, but this is the point uh, which comes next. They bask predominantly to thermoregulate, many early and late afternoon hours, for a couple of minutes only. Uh, so it means they do not spend too much time on the sun. They uh, bask predominantly only a couple of minutes a day. Third, 
the UV irradiation is actually a side effect of basking, not a purposeful activity. It has so far never been demonstrated uh, without any question that uh, chameleons uh, expose themselves uh, to UV light really deliberately and meaningfully. They usually seek simply the source of any uh, race and uh, they get, in my opinion, the UV exposure really as a side effect of basking. Next, they hide from sun most of the time, remaining in shade with low UV exposure. I have demonstrated on many uh, cases that the chameleons at the daytime are, on the majority of the cases, found in the shade and it's not easy to find them and even those species that we that we really keep in captivity very often it means the yemen chameleon and the panther chameleon they are to be found in the majority of the cases in shade uh, some uh, smart guys can ask a tricky question but why is that that we see the videos of uh, the uh, chameleons in Yemen, for instance, in the midday, on, on in the noontime, basking and exposing their bodies to sun. Uh, and the same uh, can some people uh, tell about, for instance, uh, nocibe males. So my answer is very simple. If you count together all the videos of uh, Panthers and uh, uh, Yemen chameleons that do so at noontime when the uh, UV exposure is really very high, then uh, please uh, also see what is the sex. And the sex of these animals will be always males. So uh, my explanation is very simple. These are the uh, males which are dominant and they do not bask. They expose themselves to sun only as a side effect of their imposing to other males that also protect their territories and with the colors they uh, signal to the males which are sitting closer or further in the field that they are on this tree the uh, landlord. And because they cannot do it from the middle of the of the shade of the bush or of the canopy, because no one would see them, they uh, climb high and expose themselves. But they do not do it purposefully to bask. They do it to show off only. Okay, um, the chameleons protect themselves against destructive UV effects through melanin production. And this is exactly why these males actually survive. Uh, I have dissected uh, three uh, decades ago several wild uh, calyptratus from Yemen. And I was astonished. The not dominant males, which were sitting in the shade, were white and pink inside. And those guys, which were the huge, dominant, colorful males that uh, sat on the tops of the trees and imposed each other, they were completely black like an asphalt inside. This is how they protect themselves with an extreme production of melanin against the negative influence of the UV light uh, when they have to expose themselves this way. Connected with this, uh, it's also uh, clear that the chameleons do not primarily climb up to bask in the wild because it does not make sense. They do not need to bask uh, in the upper parts of the trees. They need to go to the side because the exposure to uh, UV rays and to infrared rays is actually no difference whether perceived from the top of the tree uh, or uh, from the side of the tree. It is the same. So if we see the chameleons uh, going up, it is for completely different reasons. And uh, we will get to this point uh, when we discuss the captive uh, implications, because the fact that our chameleons climb up for basking is not their natural behavior. It is because we place in the captivity the sources of heat 
on the top of the cage and not on the side. And last but not least, we need to know that the chameleons get a certain dose of UV daily, which we cannot measure, but we can calculate it approximately. We have no device and no possibility to measure the dose of the irradiation by the uh, ultraviolet lights, by the UV. But uh, we have this option, for instance, if you go to a nuclear power station, you will get a small uh, box on, on in your pocket, which is called the Geiger-Miller computer, or it's called the dosimeter, which is a device that can measure actually the uh, amount of irradiation by nuclear uh, rays that you have got while uh, being exposed to the, it uh, on the walk through the uh, nuclear power station. But we do not have such device for UV. But we are lucky that we can actually calculate it because once we uh, understand how long they expose themselves to the UV light and what the UV light intensity is, uh, regardless how precise or unprecise the UV index, UVI is, we can quantify the daily doses of uh, chameleons that they get through the UV light. And all these facts and all these observations are crucial for us to do the next step and to look into the area of uh, how we can actually simulate the facts from the wild in the captivity and how can we do it as naturalistically as possible and as precisely as possible to simulate the natural conditions out there in the wild. So finally, let us see what are the implications of all the information which we discussed to the day-to-day -day practice of keeping chameleons in captivity. There is a good news that the producers of UV lamps, which solve actually this issue, are really progressing step by step and bringing to the market better and better lamps that can be used to simulate the natural conditions. What we need to understand is that there are many constraints. One of it is that there is no ideal lamp and uh, the uh, offer is changing from months to months, sometimes even week to week, so that the availability of different UV sources is uh, tremendous and the number is increasing. Nowadays, please remember that the only real uh, proper solution for the layman, for not professional breeding, is actually the widely recommended linear source, which is a tube uh, usually of 60 centimeters, means two feet length, and output of about 24 watts. And let us see first what are actually then the constraints and limitations of the UV lamps. And uh, let us uh, debate about it a little bit, step by step, and then we make the final conclusions. The first constraint is that actually any of the lamp, as uh, already discussed, reducts its output with the distance from it. We can nothing do with the physical principle that the intensity of any light drops with the square of the distance. Because our sources are not uh, from the point, but they are linear, then the intensity drops a little bit less, but, but the principle is anyway there. Very close to the lamp, the lamp is giving such high output that it can very easily burn the chameleon, burn its skin and cause even blindness. And uh, with every centimeter, every inch of the distance from the lamp, the uh, output is diminishing so that most of the lamps uh, in a distance of two feet do not emit any more any measurable UVI. And within this approximately one to two feet, 
uh, distance, we need to do something that is okay for the chameleons. So we cannot illuminate all the cage with uh, uh, sufficient UV. We are limited by these two factors. Let us see it in practice. So let me demonstrate you one problem that we have with the UV lamps uh, that provide uh, UV light for our chameleons. This is a new lamp from Arcadia, 6% of UV. And if we measure the intensity of light with UV meter, just next to the lamp, then we find out that we get values around 34 or 35 or even 38. This intensity of UV light is capable of destroying the retina of the eyes of Caminus within a few minutes. But look, if we measure the intensity of light with the same lamp about one feet below, we get intensities around two UVI, which is approximately the intensity of a shade under a palm tree. Now look what happens if we measure the intensity of UV light in a real situation in a normal cage. This is a mesh cage. The ceiling is made from mesh and the 6% UV bulb from Arcadia is approximately 10 centimeters above the ceiling. So just here at the ceiling we can measure UVI around 3. Here a little bit lower where the chameleon sits we have just one and a half and half foot 10 centimeters lower we almost cannot measure the uh, UVI because it's 0, 0, 004 0, 0, 005 so it's almost immeasurable the further constraint is that the UV lamps are actually delivered in different strength categories the strength of a UVB lamp is marked as a percentage of UVB from the total light output and reaches from 15 to 16%. For the usage for chameleon cages, dependent on the size and dependent on uh, the purpose and species, we usually use almost the entire uh, range. Uh, with the exception that above 12%, it's very rare to use. Another problem is the guarantee of the outputs. We cannot rely on them. Uh, the problem is that uh, the most manufacturers guarantee usable UV for six months, maximum a year, uh, with a daily use of 12 hours. Uh, some of the uh, fabricants uh, do fit in this range, some even exceed it, but we you never know what kind of lamp you have and how much UV light it actually gives if it is one, two, three or four months uh, old because the next problem is the deterioration. The loss of the UV output is quite quick. Moreover, individuality is also a next constraint. Each lamp can give other output and deteriorate differently. You can get lamps from the same uh, shop with the same uh, production date and they will give different outputs. And the output also um, depends uh, on the reflector. It means on the device around the lamp that reflects the light down to the cage. Uh, with good reflections you get good numbers but without these special reflection uh, devices you can get output which is uh, maximum 50% sometimes even 30% of the real potential output of the lamp. So you are really in a very bad situation because you never know if you get a lamp and if you use it for some time what actual UVI, it means the intensity of the UVB light it delivers. And the only issue uh, how to solve that is to buy a UVI meter, which uh, are not that easily available. And uh, it's uh, also 
a big range uh, amongst uh, these uh, UV meters that you can purchase. Uh, the best ones are around $500 and up. The regular ones around $350. You can get even cheaper ones, but they are not that reliable. Sometimes they are good and sometimes they give you uh, false numbers. So, but this is the only way how to actually really control what UV uh, output the lamps give you. But this type of investment, usually a normal person that has one or two chameleons at home does not do. So uh, you are a little bit blindfolded with the production. And last but not least, uh, we cannot, uh, based on the international regulations and, and logic of the electric uh, devices, put the lamps inside of the, of the cages. So they need to be put outside. And they need to be put outside, not uh, shining the UV uh, across uh, glass, because glass absorbs UV by almost 100%. So you would uh, have a lamp, but it would not work. So you need to have the uh, ceiling, the top of your cage, made by mesh. And the mesh also uh, eats lots of the uh, UVB. Let us see it on a concrete example. So now let us see what happens uh, if we expose the UV light to go through a mesh from which the standard cages are made. If we measure uh, the new lamp, the intensity of UV light, we get uh, values like 53, 54, 55. If we do this one, that we measure it through one layer of the mesh, we get layers around 33, 34. And if we let it go through double mesh, then we get only 24, 23. This is how the mesh diminishes the amount of UV light going to the cage. So if the cage is made from mesh on the top, about 30% on each layer of the mesh is actually absorbed. So what we need to understand is how to properly use the various lamps. And actually you cannot really measure all the lamps. So uh, I have selected some for you to give you an overview and show you how it actually works. Look on this charts, we have four lamps and we need to understand uh, the most important thing, which is what is actually the usable UV light by the chameleons. And the usable UV light is such light that uh, lays between uh, zero impact, because zero impact is uh, for nothing, and between the maximum the chameleon can survive without any harm. And provisionally, I will put the uh, risky zone uh, at the level of UVI 10 plus. It is higher than uh, most of my colleagues actually recommend, but I'll tell you why. The issue is the length of the exposure. Uh, I have measured it in the field, so I'm 100% confident that chameleons uh, not only survive, but, but can easily tolerate the UV eyes of uh, uh, 10, 14, which is normal in Yemen, even 17 and even levels higher than 20. But they do not uh, expose themselves to these high levels of UVI too long. They expose themselves to these levels only for a couple of minutes. So I'm 100% confident and I made these experiments in uh, the cages in captivity that a short exposure, maximum 20 with a limit of about 30 minutes at uh, 10 uh, UVI is not harmful, at least for the big chameleon species like the Jackson's chameleon, the uh, uh, Yemen chameleon and the panther chameleon. What is below is usable. And here 
you can see the comparison of the individual lamps that show you clearly that, for instance, the last one uh, by Zoomat is uh, absolutely uh, for nothing because it can burn the eyes of the chameleon at the distance of one inch from it. But already at uh, the distance of about four inches from it, it gives merely usable UVI. So forget this. And the general uh, recommendation use the linear source is in general the good rule of thumb, but it's also not correct because the Exoterra Reptile UVB 200, which is actually a cold, uh, cold bulb, uh, is with its parameters almost equal to the uh, T5 uh, HO 6% UVB from Arcadia, which is one of the most popular and most safe uh, products on the, on the market. These two provide uh, the dangerous uh, uh, levels of uh, UVI only in the immediate vicinity of the lamp, so that we must uh, really uh, provide the chameleons with the protection not to come directly to the lamp uh, to the distance of about one or two inches all the rest is actually safe and even at the distance of about uh, 13 uh, to 15 inches the uh, lamp provides some sort of usable uvi in the cage but it definitely means that if you use uh, these two lamps, you uh, cannot expect that if the chameleon is lower than, uh, say, this 15 uh, inches and it crawls through the, through the environment of the, of the cage, that it gets any UV. It does not. Uh, while if you see it in the second column, the Arcadia T5HO 12% UVB, it actually delivers the... Uh, usable uh, UV light up to uh, around 26 inches, which is really like quite good. But you then need to be aware of that you need to place the lamp uh, around uh, one feet above the uh, cage because uh, approximately one feet is the distance where a new lamp can be dangerous for the chameleon. But then you have a really a good distance in which the uh, light uh, shines properly through the entire cage and even at uh, quite considerable distances, the chameleons can get usable levels of UV. So let us go to the final lab. And before we talk about the physical implications into the captive husbandry of chameleons, we need to open one last very important topic. Everyone speaks now about UV index. It is almost a UV frenzy uh, because everyone is focusing on UVI, UVI, UVI. I have to make a very strong statement. Chameleons do not need UVI. Chameleons do need a UV dose. How to understand that? It is like if you go to a dentist and you want to get a white repair on your teeth. So uh, the dentist will repair it a little bit, prepare a hole, and then the hole is filled in with a substance that is hardening only under the influence of UV light. So what happens? It is filled in your teeth and then the UV light is applied to the substance and it needs some time to uh, make the effect on the hardening of the substance. It does not need less time because otherwise it will not harden enough and it does not need more time. So it is a special doses that needs to be applied to this uh, substance so that it becomes from the uh, liquid uh, a hard and tooth-like hard substance. And actually the same happens with the most important and notoriously known effect of the UV light on the vertebrate physiology, which is the triggering of the uh, synthesis of the vitamin D3. 
for this purpose, also not a UVI is needed, but a certain doses of UV light. And uh, the doses we cannot measure, but we can calculate in multiplying the UVI, the index, with the time spent on that. But frankly, uh, if you need uh, doses of 10 uh, UVI hours, it is not a big difference, and it's actually no difference, whether you apply UVI 1 for 10 hours, or whether you uh, apply UVI 10 for 1 hour, because the multiplication is always 10, or whether you uh, apply UVI 2 for 5 hours. The decisive stuff is that the chameleon gets the right doses because this is the amount of energy which is needed to trigger the uh, proper and necessary synthesis of vitamin D3, which is uh, of uh, very high importance for their physiology. And... If we take this into consideration, which is not only my construct, but in some of the recent papers that appeared just this year, uh, Ferguson actually came to same conclusion in that respect. If we take this in consideration, then a whole uh, series of uh, uh, options opens uh, in front of us because we can then play with the intensity measured by UVI and the length of the exposure of the chameleons to get the final exposure that we need using the position of the chameleons, uh, the distance to the sources and the correct uh, duration of the exposure in combination. So, we have actually four typical solution options on how to apply UVB in chameleon husbandry uh, if we take all the information that we discussed today into consideration. There are four. Uh, the first is no UV usage at all. The second is the whole day exposure. The third is the short and intense exposure. And the fourth is intermittent exposure. We will discuss these options in detail now. Let us start with the first option, which is based just on vitamin D3, and it's called no UV lamp. Actually, you can really uh, keep your chameleon relatively healthy with uh, using no UV lamp at all. Uh, people will not like this uh, statement because it is a big business, of course, uh, for the producers of these lamps and so on. But, you know, back in the 90s, we did not have any UV sources and we were able to keep and reproduce chameleons in many generations without any UV lamps. So uh, how we did it? Well, uh, we did it in a way that we simply added the vitamin D3 directly in its synthetic form to the uh, uh, diet of chameleons and they of course survived without any big problems. In fact, some of the breeders that uh, swear that they have uh, used the coiled lamps with almost no UVI output for years now with very good result, do actually the same service as we did in the 90s. Because if the coiled lamps actually do not deliver UV light, they can keep the animals alive only if they supplement them properly and if they add the vitamin D3 either separately or in combination with uh, the calcium or in combination with all the other uh, minerals and vitamins in vitamin mixtures, in multivitamin mixtures like for instance the Reptivit or the multivitamin of uh, Exotera and so on. So uh, 
they swear that their uh, solution works with coiled lamp, but the coiled lamp did not deliver any uh, usable D3 to the chameleon. So the chameleons really uh, survived only on the artificial doses of the synthetic vitamin D3. Now, I listen this as an option while I do not advocate it. I advocate not to do it. I advocate to use the D3 adding to the diet of the chameleons only as a backup solution for the option that they do not get enough D3 because we cannot control it uh, in, in fact, uh, as we have uh, discussed and demonstrated. Not to provide UV is actually a fault because it does not only work uh, for the triggering of the vitamin D3 synthesis, which we can somehow substitute with the artificial uh, way of uh, administration, but it has so many other positive uh, influences on the organism and on, on uh, almost all internal organs uh, that uh, we cannot simply say, do not use UV uh, because you do not need to. You need to because it is natural and the energy delivered by the light is vital for the chameleon. So I list this option only for the emergency situations and for uh, like completeness of the list. Now, the second option is what I call the whole day exposure. Most of the experts uh, Proposed now as a safe uh, model of uh, delivering the UV, the permanent or many hours switched on UV lamps in the cage and recommend that the area which is used for basking, where the chameleon stays to bask, uh, the level uh, around 2 to 3 UVI. This uh, is something that uh, I can recommend as one of the good options. It is uh, actually quite widespread option now and it has uh, not too many negative uh, uh, potential uh, effects. Uh, maybe only that, uh, you know, not always you can really uh, simulate what the other experts have done uh, either for uh, months or even years. But it is a vivid uh, option and uh, you can go for it. For this, you need uh, to place the lamps properly uh, in a way that I already uh, stated. It means that you need to make sure that the chameleon is uh, receiving the UVI around 2 to 3 at the place where it is the most of the day uh, present. So it means that in the case of the 6% uh, T5HO uh, UVB lamp, you need to put this lamp just above the top of the cage uh, or to lay it on the ceiling to facilitate the distance to the chameleon of about 2 inches to prevent the burn from the UVB. So uh, this is the safe position. If you use the Arcadia T5HO 12% UVB lamp, then you need to position it about 10 to 15 inches above the ceiling so that the area which is dangerous with the UV eye levels uh, above 10 is actually out of the reach of the chameleon. The slight disadvantage of this option uh, is in two points. One point is that actually the lamp is uh, aging very quickly because you use it uh, 8 to 12 hours per day so that it ages uh, in a way that uh, the uh, fabricants uh, uh, recommend actually that you need to replace it every around six months because it, it becomes dead and does not deliver any usable UV light anymore. And of course you spend energy for which you need to pay. The second disadvantage is actually that if you calculate that uh, the average uh, UVI at this place will be around 3 
and the chameleon will spend at this uh, place of the cage in the reach of the lamp at the UV level of around three, uh, almost whole day, which is 12 hours, then you end up in UVI hours in the case of uh, the Yemen chameleon uh, of the level of 36, which is actually almost the double of the necessary dose which we calculated based on its natural behavior in the wild. And I'm not sure that it is really like a good solution to uh, expose the chameleon to the double of the doses. Of course, the chameleon can hide a little bit, can go down in the cage, can uh, seek a shelter so that the number will be in fact a little bit lower. But anyway, uh, the exposure can be actually too much. So these are these two disadvantages of this method. But let us now see the third method, which I call the intermittent exposure, uh, which is based on special attraction. What I mean by that? I mean by that the following. We said that if we need, in the case of the Yemen chameleon, to provide the UVI hours at the level of 20, it is actually not so much important how we get that 20. The 20 we can get if we expose it for 10 hours to UVI 2, or that we expose it to UVI 4 just for 5 hours, or to UVI 5, just by four hours. Or even that we use UVI 7 and we use it only for three hours. It is still in the safe zone that nothing could happen to the chameleon. Um, he will not get any burn, but instead of shining and spending energy for 10 hours, we can use UVI 7 and spend only three hours exposing the chameleon to this light. We can do it safely, uh, not in a way that we put it on for three hours in one uh, like hit, but we'll do it maybe intermittently, one hour by one hour by one hour. If we allow the chameleon to bask at UVI 7, for three times one hour per day, it will get the doses of 21 UEI hours, which is actually equal to the doses that he uh, gets in the wild. Now, in this case, we, however, need to make sure that the chameleon really stays at this uh, location and receives really this uh, relatively high UVI exposure. How we can do it, it is very simple. Uh, many people say that the chameleons tend to spend the most of their time in the upper part of the cage. The truth is why it is like that. It's not that they like it. It is not that they would prefer it. It is because the light in the lower parts of the cage is not enough for them to see properly because the, the same uh, deterioration of the uh, light intensity as is uh, uh, true for the UV light is actually working also for the visible light so that the light becomes less by the square of the distance from the source. And it means that if the light is proper in the upper half of the cage, Inevitably, and there's nothing to do against that, uh, the light from the, the uh, artificial source, which is uh, situated on the top of the cage, will not be enough to make the chameleon happy and see properly in the lower parts of the cage. So what we can do is that uh, we can use this and uh, attract the chameleon to the upper part of the, of the cage while dimming a little bit the, the light so that he gets closer to the ceiling. We have the UV uh, lamp there um, situated, so it will stay there. And if he wants to make sure that he goes also to the other parts, we can make the light 
more intense so that the intensity becomes a little bit uh, less comfortable uh, for him in the upper parts and uh, we will move him uh, to the comfort zone a little bit more down. And this is how we can actually facilitate the fact to receive enough of this uh, exposure to UV uh, in attracting them to the uh, right spatial uh, place in the cage. We must be very careful not to make it too much and not to make it too intense, but in fact, the... Uh, absolutely undisputable uh, advantage of this approach is actually that if you reduce the usage of the UV lamp uh, from 12 hours per day to 3 hours per day, then you prolong its lifetime by four times. It means that the same lamp that would normally hold the uh, proper UV light uh, like output just for half a year will actually uh, be necessary to be replaced only after two years. And this, of course, is economically very advantageous. And uh, in that case, uh, you can even consider to invest in high quality lamps and not to save, specifically if you have uh, at home several of the cages, it can be quite costly, you know, that you can really invest in very high quality and reliable products and not to save on getting some uh, not really high quality stuff. So, and last but not least, we have the short and intense exposure uh, way how to do uh, what, we, what we discuss. Um, as I said, in the wild, the chameleons do not uh, struggle in being exposed to UVI levels of 14, even 17, even 20. If the exposure is not too long, it means not longer than, say, half an hour, then it is perfectly okay. So, theoretically, you can do the following way. You can uh, use a very strong lamp that in a Co concrete and controllable place in a specific distance from it and best uh, would be also to measure the uh, exposure uh, physically with a UV meter, you can have the exposure, for, for instance, for uh, UVI 15 and let the chameleon there for, uh, let's say, 30 minutes, which uh, would mean that he would, within these 30 minutes, actually tank energy of seven uh, UVI hours. And if you do it two or three times, he gets the necessary doses. Uh, this uh, practice is not only a theory, but it is practiced by a friend of mine who authorized me to uh, even uh, make a reference to him. It is uh, Jonas uh, Nix from uh, Germany, from Berlin, who practices this in his very successful breeding programs of many Madagascan species and including his big farm of his beautiful panther chameleon. So it is not a theory, it is really working. Uh, I cannot say it is 100% uh, safe. Uh, you need really to have a proper setup and make sure that the chameleon is sitting on the proper space and does not get too high doses and get not too much heated. But with a little of experimenting, this is also one thing that can happen and can work properly, especially if you have uh, many chameleons so that you cannot afford having, I don't know, 30 uh, UV lamps uh, and uh, you cannot afford uh, paying uh, the high electric bills just for shining uh, this um, UVI, uh, not to the chameleon because the, um, the uh, effort that you get is uh, very minute in uh, comparison to the energy that which is spent for letting the lamps actually work. So, and that's it. Actually, if you ask me what I advocate 
uh, of these four uh, versions. So I can say uh, quite clearly, uh, the no UV exposure version, it's not what I recommend for the reasons I said. The based on expert advice, whole day exposure way is safe, is fine, it's proper and uh, you, you cannot say anything against it because it is really working and based on the expert uh, recommendation, it is one of the vivid formulas how to provide UVI. I am the biggest friend of the intermittent exposure based on spatial attraction because it is saving lots of money, lots of energy and lots of headache and you just need to find out the way how to attract the chameleon uh, to the uh, specific place where you uh, temporarily increase the uh, UV exposure to a little bit higher but still very safe levels. Uh, and I advocate this uh, version uh, not only because it works, but because it also saves a lot of money and saves a lot of energy, which is otherwise spent uselessly. Uh, I uh, can say that the last, it means the short and intense exposure based on concentrated energy is a vivid formula. It is undisputable because it really works. I suggest to practice this only uh, to professionals and only in the case that uh, really there is a constraint of the investment or other technical reasons why to do it. It is a vivid formula, but for uh, laymen having uh, at home only one or two chameleons, it is, I think, too much and too much uh, manipulation. So my recommendation is just do either based on expert advice, long-term exposure or uh, the intermittent exposure version. Both work and both will deliver healthy and proper uh, uh, exposed to UV animals which will thrive and be okay with uh, their the vitamin D3 production and will uh, be also fine because of the general positive UV light influence on their health. So, we are at the end. So I hope that uh, what I promised at the very beginning uh, became true. I hope that you understand much more about the biology of chameleons and about their exposure to UV in the wild as well as in the captivity. And you can actually use your own uh, deliberate choice to select the proper way how to use the equipment which is now widely available in the pet stores and in the trade. Uh, in order to make the life of your chameleons as comfortable as possible and as nice and as close to the natural conditions which they are exposed to when they live in the wild. Thank you for listening and uh, stay tuned.